The front cover of the book is, um, is a photograph of me taken, I think, when I was six, around that age, um, which I just found in among many other photographs that I had from the past. I must have, it must have been one I claimed in, in 1984 when we split up all the photographs that belonged to the family. Um, the reason why I thought it was so perfect for the book was because it's me as I could have been, <laughs> as I was, obviously, when I was six, but as I could have been still now. So it's this other version of me before the sudden death of my mother. And you see all the qualities there, right there on the front of the book. Um, you see this kind of ebullience. You see, I, I just look so full of life and confidence. I, I almost look brash. And not long after that, I became someone else. So I just thought that picture works so perfectly with the title, This Party's Got to Stop. You see this young boy running towards you full of life. You've got a title like that. You know something's about to happen. The house on Summerdown Road is the only house I ever knew as a child. It's the house I was born in and the house I grew up in. But so, you know, 17, 18 years of experience, ex experience of that house. But not just that. Um, the house had been in my family for some 50 years. So my grandfather and grandmother had come back from Japan where they were living, where my mother was born. They came back to Eastbourne, they bought that house in about 1938-39, um, moved in. It's the house where my grandfather died, it's the house where my grandmother went mad. Um, it was a house which by the 1950s was standing completely empty. My grandmother was in, a, in some kind of um, institution in Northampton. So when my father met my mother, um, they had very little money. They couldn't have afforded a house. They contacted my grandmother and said, could they live in the house for a while until she came back? And she said, rather famously, I'm never coming back. <laughs> so um, it became our house. Um, and as I say, it's the, it's the childhood home. It's the place where everything happened. When my father died suddenly in 1984, I been away from Eastbourne for a number of years and uh, I felt as if I was finally free of all that, free of all the past and free of all my childhood. I was living in West Berlin at the time um, with my girlfriend and from one day to the next when I got the news of my father's equally sudden death I flew back um, and moved back into the house and much to my surprise so did both my two brothers Robin and Ralph. And my youngest brother, Ralph, had a, had a wife, Vivian, and a, and a little baby, a six-month-old baby as well. So there were suddenly five of us, all living in this place together. We were, like, we were like children again, I suppose. Even though we were in our 20s, we were like children again, but with no parents. So there was no one to control us. And I, I guess what happened in the seven months that we lived there was a kind of... Con it, was a, it became a period of kind of anarchy. On the one hand, you had a very small family with a baby trying to make their way. On the other hand, you had these two brothers who kept their drugs in the larder next to the baby food and were playing music all night and going up to London to parties. And these two, as you can imagine, didn't work terribly well together. I mean, the odd thing is that I thought myself and Robin were the normal ones at the time. Now I look back on it, I think, no, it was the other way around. The way in which I constructed the book um, was curious. I, I, at the beginning, when I started, I thought it was going to be a very simple book, starting with the death of my father, ending with us moving out of the house when we'd sold it. The lovely last scene of, um, we forgot about my father's bed. You know, it was midday, we had to leave the house. It had to be empty. And we had to drag my father's bed up the garden and put it on the bonfire. So as we left the house and climbed into cars and drove away, there was this thick plume of oily smoke rising up behind the hedge. Um, I thought, great beginning, great ending, um, I just have to do the middle. <laughs> um, I did that a couple of times and it just didn't work. I then realized that the book had to be, become something else. Um, I had to kind of find ways of throwing light on, on that time that time in 1984, I had to create more resonance and more tension. And I did that by going to see some other members of my family who I hadn't seen for a long time, um, asking them questions, both about myself and my brothers and about my parents. And, you know, what, we, what were we like? 
actually, was my big question. What was I like? What were they like? Um, and they were all extraordinary characters, uh, these, these <laughs> members of my family. Um, you know, you, had, you have uh, Auntie Beth living in a tottering three-story cottage on the outskirts of Stroud, um, alone, been alone there for 20 years, 25 years. Um, you can hardly get into her house because she has Diogenes syndrome, I think it's called, which is something that happens to a lot of old people. They, they lose the ability to distinguish between possessions and rubbish. <laughs> so all the rubbish remains in the house and, and there are pathways through it. So when I arrived at Auntie Beth's house, for instance, she said very sweetly, I've cleared a space for you. She meant that quite literally. <laughs> Um, there was a little space in the corner of the living room <clears throat> where I was able to sit. And uh, Auntie Beth, there's uh, Uncle Joe who became a Muslim who was living in Wolverhampton in a, s a home for destitute old men. Um, and the book builds up with these encounters to a reunion or a possible reunion with my long lost brother. Because this part he's got to stop is, is actually many things. It's, it's a portrait of an eccentric family. It's a a picture of a, of, of a family dealing with grief and loss and death. But it's also, among other things, a, and this came as a real surprise to me, a, a kind of love letter to my long lost brother, um, the brother I hadn't seen for 25 years. So the various encounters in the book, the, the things that made it work structurally, also create a kind of momentum that builds towards this one final meeting. Has has the book changed me as a person and as a writer? It's a very complex question because the first thing I think of is it's changed our family. I mean, in a very Californian way, you know, this has been a kind of healing journey. <laughs> Again, much to my surprise. Um, I've set off trying to write one kind of book. It became something very proactive. Um, I realized that it was giving me opportunities to do certain things, to re-meet people, to try and find people, to try and solve mysteries within my family, to come up with answers if I possibly could. So the book was a journey in a very physical way as well as on, on the page or on the screen. You know, it wasn't just uh, an internal journey. It was very much a kind of physical journey that took me all over the world as, as far afield as, as Shanghai and Zurich, places I hadn't expected to go. Um, in terms of being a writer, I, I'm, that, that's hard to judge at the moment because um, I've started a book since, which is so completely different. Um, if it's changed me at all, perhaps it's given me that feeling of, I just, I want to open out now completely. I want to paint on a very, very big canvas because there is something, something of the straitjacket about the memoir. You are dealing with things that really happened. You're dealing with real people and you're dealing with real events. And, and that's, it's hard to, to find ways to make your imagination work in that context. But, so I think I'm, I'm sort of exploding out of that now and I'm, I'm going wider.